Hello Harvest, my name is Aaron, and my wife Natalie and I, along with my parents Joyce and Craig, are thrilled to announce that Jackson Aaron Weeks right here was born on August the 13th at 5.12 a.m. Jackson's, Jackson's birth has already been such a blessing to our lives, but we are even more grateful that through God's grace, he was born completely healthy despite having his umbilical cord tied in a knot and wrapped around his neck at birth. So we just wanted to share the news with everyone at Harvest, and we look forward to the day that Jackson can meet the rest of his Harvest family. Thank you. Good morning, Harvest. We just want to come and just uh, give praise and acknowledgement to our Lord and Savior this morning. Amen. For bringing us through a, a, a time that we had to go through a, a trial as far as dealing with that uh, COVID. So this morning, we just want to just give a little testimony of uh, just being thankful for what God has done for us you know going through uh getting this thing at the same time and uh which uh all worked out for the good that them that love the lord and we truly love him and we just want to give acknowledgement uh for uh, just not having to go through a ventilator amen and uh, you know not having to uh just suffer a whole lot i'm saying it wasn't you know uh fun but then it could have been worse and uh we just thank god that it didn't get worse and we just want to come and just thank god this morning to uh, let everybody know that god is good and he's good all the time amen, amen. so we just want to just share you know uh, how good he was to us with you all uh this morning i'm quite sure angie want to say something uh good morning to everyone uh it's a blessing just to be healthy to say that we are um, back to business as usual for us our life uh, and doing our COVID events, uh, I had it first and then we took care of me first and then vice versa. I she gave it to me. <laughs> <laughs> My grandmother passed away gave it to us. <laughs> but uh, all jokes aside, uh, so even through the grief process of that and we both ended up with the COVID problem. Uh, uh, in the next couple of days, uh, we tested positive, uh, but we're healthy, doing good, and it's a blessing, you know, just to be able just to give a testimony to our Harvest family, and we truly love Harvest and our Pastor Mike and First Lady, Miss Kim Jones. We love you guys. Yeah, y'all, y'all do us great, you know, calling and bringing stuff. Uh, I just got awesome uh, amen. neighbors, amen. Every time I walked to the door, it was something sitting on the porch. I thought you thought it was a leopard camp for real. <laughs> you know, they would put it on the porch and run, and, <laughs> won't they, Pastor Mike? <laughs> But anyway, uh, again, we just want to come and tell y'all we miss you, you know, and that we're doing great, amen, and we just thank God, amen, that uh, uh, he was good, you know, and that we didn't have to suffer, you know, through that situation. So we just want to give time to uh, just, uh, just pray right now, amen, so you can bow your heads with us. Father God, we just thank you again for this day. This is the day that you have made. We're going to rejoice and be glad. And we thank you, Father God, for your mercy and your grace, Father. We thank you for your healing, Lord God. And Father, we just pray for the ones that uh, uh, that have it now, Lord God, that you would uh, make it easy for them, Lord God. And the ones that don't have it, that they don't get it, Father God. And you just thank you again and give you all the praise and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a blessed day and we love you. 
Don't and wear your mask. Wash your, your hands. We still wear these, even <laughs> though we contracted the cold, but we wear it faithfully. Amen. Hello, Harvest. My name is Winifred Smiley. I'll be so happy when we're all together again. But I want to tell you about my favorite Bible verses. It comes from 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 8. And it states, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but have not love I am nothing if I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames but have not love I gain nothing love is patient love is kind it does not envy it does not boast it is not proud it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always preserves. Love never fails. This is what I feel that God wants of me and that he expects me to act in a positive manner. Thank you. It comes from Hebrews 11 verse 1 and it says that faith now faith is assurance that things hoped for and a conviction of things not seen. To me, that's saying that when you get ready to cook a cake and you get all these, all the ingredients together, you're hoping that upon mixing these ingredients, it comes out a cake. So you have faith that these things are going to work together and come out of cake. By having faith, you're hoping for one thing. And by not giving up, going about your plan, that thing that you're hoping for will happen. Thank you. Good morning. My favorite scripture is Philippians, the fourth chapter, starting from the fourth verse through the ninth verse. And one of, it's one of my favorites because it offers words of exhortation, encouragement, and prayer as the way to find peace. Philippians the fourth chapter starting from the uh, fourth verse. Rejoice in the Lord always and again I say rejoice. Let your moderations be made known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your minds and hearts through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, Whatsoever things are pure, 
whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report. If there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Verse 9. Those things which you, which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. And the God of peace shall be with you. That was Philippians, the fourth chapter, the fourth verse through the ninth verse. Have a good day. Good morning, Harvest. My favorite Bible verses from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8, and also verse 13. And I'll gladly read it. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. 13 says, so now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Amen.
Hey Harvest, my name is Mark K. Fairley and this is my lovely wife, Carmen Fairley. We're Pastor Mike and Kim's cousins from California and we're so excited to be here with you this morning. Yes, we're so excited. Listen, I just released a project called Notes from the Heart and on that album, there's a special song that's entitled Breathe. Um, and it's simply a song that's a prayer unto our Lord, asking the Lord to breathe on us. Uh, so I pray that it encourages your heart. I pray that it brings peace and hope. Uh, to your life today as you guys hear it uh, so you can find the song on all platforms you can find it on apple music spotify and even youtube so i pray that it's a blessing to you today thank you again for having us today we're so humbled to be with you guys blessings have a great day Well, greetings, Harvest family and friends. This is Pastor Mike Jones of Harvest Community Church in Birmingham, Alabama, where we are a community of worshipers committed to Christ, commissioned to serve, and called to pray without ceasing. Let's get right into the Word of God today. So if you have your Bibles, open two places, both in the Old Testament, Psalm 13, 
Psalm 13 and Exodus chapter 2 verses 23 through 25. Psalm 13 and Exodus chapter 2 verses 23 through 25. Let's read. Psalm 13. To the chief musician, a psalm of David, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say I have prevailed against him. Lest those who trouble me rejoice when I am moved. But I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Exodus chapter 2 verses 23 through 25. Now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. Then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage and they cried out. And their cry came up to God because of the bondage. So God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham and with Isaac and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel and God acknowledged them. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your word today. We pray that you would open our eyes that we might behold wondrous things out of your law. We pray that the Lord Jesus might be lifted up, that we might see him. And in seeing him, we might believe on him and believing on him, we might be saved. This is our prayer in Jesus name. Won't you say amen? Amen and amen. Well, I want to talk for the next few minutes on the subject. How long, O oh Lord, how long, O oh Lord? I want to first look at Psalm 13 and David writes the Psalm and he opens the Psalm by saying, how long, O Lord, how long will you forget me forever? And how long will you hide your face from me? You get the idea that God was far away or David felt like God was far away from him in verse one. In verse two, it says, how long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart? daily. You get the idea that he was trying to figure out things in his own soul. Uh, he was taking counsel in his soul, trying to figure out what was going on. And all it did was result in sorrow every day in his heart. You know, he had a problem with his relationship with God. He had a problem with, with trying to figure things out on his own, in his own life. But there was a trilogy of problems because at the end of verse two, it says, how long will my enemy be exalted over me? Many of you are probably aware of the recent events with Jacob Blake in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Here is a man who was going to a location to try and see about a domestic violence situation with a couple of family members. He was not involved. The story is that he came to break things up. He's going to his car and I don't know the specifics, but it looks like he was not obeying the commands of the, the officer. I want to say this, and I want to say this very, very clear, even if that is the case, there is nothing that justifies what happened afterwards. Nothing. He goes to his car, opens the car door and tries to get in. The officer grabs his shirt and begins to shoot him in the back seven consecutive times. He is now in the hospital, probably will never walk again. He's lucky to be alive. But many of us saw those pictures and thought, not again, not again. We're just getting over Ahmaud Arbery. We're just getting over George Floyd. We, 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 we're just getting over uh, the protests, the riots, the backlash. We're, we're trying to, to see, we're getting some headway with regard to uh, getting the message across to America that black lives matter. And now this has happened. 
I talked to a couple of members via text and one member said, Pastor Mike, I feel like the book of Lamentations. I'm just I'm just distraught. I'm so hurt. I felt like we were making some headway. I thought that we would see an end to this in my lifetime, but I'm not so sure. I talked to another member who said, Pastor Mike, you know, the, our forefathers who marched and who protested, who who fought during the civil rights uh, movement, they must be made out of something different because I'm, I'm a young person and I'm exhausted. I'm just exhausted emotionally. I'm exhausted with the conversations that I have. I'm exhausted with trying to explain our position. I'm exhausted with, with trying to uh, explain the way we look at things with regard to our culture as opposed to the dominant culture. I'm just tired. And many of us are asking the question, how long will we have to keep going through this? How long will we have to, to, to see viral videos of, of us being used and abused and, 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 and shot and killed? How long do we have to have slogans like say their name? How long before Breonna Taylor gets justice? How long before we see that the system is turned around? How long? How long will, will it take for us to be viewed as equally human? How long before we see there's a police encounter and there's not a rush to violent force? How long? How long before we see uh, we get treated equally? How long? How long before we, we, we see that one of our men gets taken to Burger King after committing a crime? How long? How long before we see that, that, that when someone in our community goes to trial and someone in the dominant community goes to trial, that, that whatever uh, consequences there are and whatever sentences are hounded down, they are equal. How long? And so David is struggling within himself. David is struggling with his relationship with God. And David is struggling with how to make sense of his enemies exalting over him. And then in verse three, it says, consider and hear me, O Lord, my God, enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death, lest my enemies say I have prevailed against him, lest those who trouble me rejoice when I'm moved. What he's saying here is this, God, I need you to open my eyes. Help me process this. Help me process, Jacob Blake. Help me process what is going on. Help me know what you're doing. Because if you don't do anything, my enemies will think that evil will triumph. My enemies will actually think that they have won. The devil will think that he has the victory. You've got to do something. I need you to be active and I need you to be active right now. And so that's what he's saying. Verse five, evidently God meets him in his prayer because in verse five, he says, I have trusted in your mercy. I've trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Men and women, I want to say this really, really clear. Um, as you talk about the situations that are going on, they are not going to make sense under the sun. They are not going to make sense in a natural way. They are not going to make sense if you look through them through human eyeglasses. This is only going to make sense and you will only be able to process what is going on with an eternal perspective, with a God perspective, that God is still God, that God is still on the throne, that God still has a plan and it will not be thwarted. I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not calamity to give you a future and a hope. He may not do it tomorrow, the next day, the next month or the next year, but God's plan will not be thwarted. And so I'm going to continue 
to, to protest. I'm going to continue to use my voice. I'm going to continue to proclaim that we are all equal in God's sight. I'm going to continue to proclaim that there is systematic racism and systematic injustice. I am still going to say that it needs to be dealt with. I am still going to say that just as individuals need to repent, nations need to repent as well. I am still going to stand on the soapbox and say her name. I am still going to say that we need justice for all. I am still going to say that all lives will not matter until black lives matter. I am still going to say that white folks aren't the enemy, that cops are not the enemy, that we, our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. I am still going to say that the foundation of the system needs to change, that people's hearts and minds need to change. I am still going to say that. Still going to say that. And the question remains, Pastor Mike, how do you process that? That's why we're looking at Exodus chapters 1 and 2. I'll paraphrase Exodus chapter 1. Uh, Genesis has finished. Joseph is dead. Joseph was there in Egypt. He rose to the second highest in all of the land. He had his family there with him. His father ends up dying and he says that he's going to take care of his brothers. The children of Israel are there in Egypt and they begin to multiply. In Exodus chapter 1, it says that they grew strong. But in Exodus chapter 1, it says that there was a new king that, that came to Egypt that did not know Joseph. And so he felt threatened by the Israelites. He was fearful of the Israelites, so he pressed them into slavery. The Israelites were in slavery for 400 years. They say it was a hard slavery. It was bitter and hard bondage that they were pressed into service and all manner of service. That's what the scripture says. And not only that, it went a step forward. The king decided that he would perpetrate genocide upon the Israelites by killing all of the male children. But if it were not for a group of, of courageous women who decided that they would not kill the babies when they were born, that they saved a nation, and we'll talk about that on a later date. But these women decided that they would not do that. In the beginning of chapter 2, Moses is born. Moses is there with his family for three months. They see that he is a, a beautiful child, but they can't keep him for long because they, they, of the edict of killing the baby. So they put him in a wicker basket. And, and you all know the story. Pharaoh's daughter raises him. Well, when he grows up, he sees the hard labor of his countrymen. He sees the hard labor of the Israelites. And he decides that he wants to do something about it. He sees an Egyptian and an Israelite fighting, and he decides to kill the Egyptian. The next day, he sees two Israelite men fighting, and he tells them to stop. And one of the Israelites says, who are you? Are you our, our prince and our judge? Are you going to kill us the same way you killed that Egyptian yesterday? Well, he knows that uh, things have been found out, so he flees Egypt, and he goes to Midian. He starts raising a family there in Midian. And then we get all the way to verse 23 of chapter 2. And it's almost as if there is a transition. We don't see God's hand early on in chapter 1. The only time you see God moving in chapter 1 is that he commends those, those Hebrew midwives for not killing the babies. But you don't see the activity of God the same way you did when Joseph was, was going through in, at the end of Genesis. You don't see the hand of God. But the book of Exodus makes a transition in chapter 2, verses 23 through 25. We read it just a minute ago, but I'll read it again. It happened in the process of time, verse 23, that the king of Egypt died. Then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage and they cried out and their, they, their cry came up to God because of the bondage. They are praying. They are crying out to God in anguish. They are crying out to God in des desperation. I can hear the Hebrew voices saying, how long, O Lord? How long will we have to suffer this bondage? How long will we have to see our boys die? How long will we be in service? How long will, be, will, we, 
will we be looked upon as less than human? How long will this injustice last? I can hear them crying out to the Lord and praying. And, and, and the cry came up to God because of the bondage at the end of verse 23. And the way we're to process, the way we're to process injustice and the way we're to process the way we've been treated and the way we're to process this, this is a prayer. This is a prayer that is prayed that has both an earthly side and a heavenly side. The earthly side is found in verse 23 that talks about the anguish that is going on here, the anguish that God's people experience, the anguish that is ongoing. But in verses 24 and 25, we see the activity of heaven. We see what God is doing. We see what God is up to when things like what Jacob Blake endured happened. We see what happens there when people are oppressed. And it ought to bring us comfort as we move along. Four things. Number one, God heard their groaning. God hears God here, Psalm 55, verse 17 says, Evening and morning and at noon I will pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. God hears. Number two, it says God remembered his covenant with Abraham and with Isaac and with Jacob. God only not only hears, but God remembers. It says he remembers their covenant. Well, what does that have to do with him remembering? Has he forgotten about us? No, he hasn't forgotten. That remembering means that he is poised to act. It's almost as if he's mentioning remembering the way he does in Genesis 8.1, where it says he remembered Noah. The way he does in Genesis 19.29, where it says he remembers Abraham. The way he does it in, in Genesis 30, verse 22, where it says he remembered Rachel and opened up her womb. The way he does in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 19, where it says he remembered her, meaning Hannah, and opened up her womb. In each one of those cases, the scripture says that he remembered them, and all of a sudden, after the remembering, God acts. He not only hears, but he remembers. And verse 25 says, and God looked upon the children of Israel. Some translations say that God saw the children of Israel. God sees us. God is not blind. God sees. He sees the slavery. He sees the oppression. He sees the discrimination. He sees the racism. He sees the police brutality. He sees the hurt and pain. He sees the frustration. How long? I don't know how long, but God, God sees. How long? I don't know how long, but, but God hears. How long? I don't know how long, but God remembers. And not only that, in verse 25, it says, And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God acknowledged them. Some translations say in the King James, it says, God had respect unto them. In the Message Bible, it says, God understood them. In the NIV, it says, God was concerned about them. In the English Standard Version, it says, God knew them. But I like what it says in the New Living Translation. It says, God knew it was time to act. Men and women, how long? I don't know. But the way I'm going to process this, the way I'm going to endure this, the way I'm going to set my mind on this is to know that God hears, is to know that God remembers, is to know that God sees and to know that he knows and acknowledges us. He sees us. He knows that it's a time to act. So I'm going to keep on praying. I'm going to keep on serving. I'm going to keep on marching. I'm going to keep on protesting. I'm going to keep on posting. I'm going to keep on bringing to people's attention that we are all one. I'm going to keep telling white folks that our fight isn't against white folks, but it's against the system. I'm going to keep telling white folks that that is not the issue, that there really is systemic racism. I'm going to keep telling white folk that you don't have to be afraid of us. You know, Jacob Blake could be me. I remember having a gun drawn on me. I don't talk about it much, 
But they don't know that I'm a pastor. All they see is a black man. And I'm asking the question deep in my heart. How long, Lord? How long will I be seen as less? How long? How long will our boys have to drive at nighttime in fear whenever they see flashing lights? How long? How long will they ever have to get nervous when the officer gets out of his car and walks toward theirs? How long? How long do, do, do they have to, to be in desperation knowing that if their hands aren't on the steering wheel or if they don't obey a command or if they disobey something very, very simple, even if they don't have a weapon, they can be in danger. How long? And the Lord says, the way you can find comfort is that I hear your groaning. I remember my covenant. I see my children. And I acknowledge them. I know them. Aren't you glad? The rest of the book of Exodus is about a man named Moses. In answer to this prayer, God raises up Moses. In answer to this prayer, God raises up a deliverer. In answer to this prayer, God says, what I will do is act and I will act swiftly and I will act sovereignly and I will act powerfully and I will do what only I can do. I will deliver you. And I've got to trust that that's going to happen here. I've got to trust that that is in our future. I got to trust that if I keep trusting and walking with him, that, that it will happen. No, he's not going to bring a Moses. No, he's not going to bring a Martin Luther King. He has brought the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is our deliverer. Jesus is the one who will free us. Jesus is the one who is sovereign and powerful. Jesus is the one who will step in front of this system and say, enough is enough. Let my people go. Jesus is the one that they relied upon during slavery. Jesus is the one that they relied upon during Jim Crow. Jesus is the one that they relied upon during the civil rights movement. Jesus is the one that we will rely upon now. We will put our trust in him and him alone. It's Jesus. He is the deliverer. He is the one who is sovereign. Because Jesus will not only deliver us from without, Jesus will deliver us from within. God not only delivered the Israelites from without, the enemies of the Egyptians, he was in the process of delivering them from themselves. He didn't deliver them because they were so, so perfect and so sinless and so righteous and so honorable. No, he said, I will deliver you from the hand of Pharaoh, but I will deliver you from the hand of sin as well. And men and women, we need a complete deliverance today. So that if you are under the sound of my voice, the first, uh, the first movement of activism, the first, the first thing that you could do to say, I want to deliver my people is to ask Jesus to deliver you. The first thing that you can do is give your heart and your mind and your soul to Jesus Christ. Because quiet as it's kept, the power of the civil rights movement where the people of God would pray and the people of God would sing and the people of God would fellowship and the people of God would witness and the people of God would glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus did something in our lives. And Jesus is saying, I want to do it again. I'm praying that we would process this situation with knowing that God hears us, with knowing that God remembers us, with knowing that God sees us and knowing that he acknowledges and knows us and knows that now, now is the time to act. And as I close, I would say to you, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day for you to give your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you believe in deliverance? I do. 
the same way He delivered the children of Israel, He can deliver you. I know that He delivered me. Let's pray. Father God, if there is someone under the sound of my voice that has never found true freedom in Jesus Christ, I pray that they would find it today. Today is the day of salvation. Lord, simply pray if you want to. Pray and you desire Jesus. Pray, Lord Jesus, I need you. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins and liberating me. Thank you for forgiving my sins. And thank you for forgiving me eternal life. Lord, take control of the throne of my life. Make me the kind of person. Deliver me from without and deliver me from within. As I close in prayer, I pray a hedge of protection around our boys. I pray a hedge of protection around our girls. I pray a hedge of protection around those in our community. Lord, protect us. Protect us. Lord, deliver all of us. All, all people. All people. Regardless of color. Make us one. Give us your love. In Jesus' name. Won't you say amen? Amen and amen. Until next week, remember Jesus. He remembers you. We are